grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, every physical malady, every one of them, is the result of man's fall into sin. If there were no sin, there would be no blindness. There would be no deafness. If there were no sin, there would be no funerals. No sin, there would be no graveyards. There would be no death. Thus, every physical malady has as its source, and thus every phys- has sin as its source, and thus every physical malady is pointing us to sin and its nature. Obviously, not all experience physical blindness, but we are in fact born spiritually blind, shrouded in darkness. We've already sung of that this morning. Thus, St. Paul describes his mission to the Gentiles as a mission to open their eyes and to what? Turn them from darkness to light. So too, not all experience physical deafness, but we are all born deaf to the Word of God. The Word of God to us when we are born is like Char- is listening to Charlie Brown's mother. Wah, 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 wah. We cannot decipher it. We're unable to discern its meaning. And thus the prophet Jeremiah laments, Behold, the ears are closed, and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them, and they have no delight in it. So too, while those of us gathered here have not yet experienced physical death, we are still born spiritual stillborns dead in our trespasses and our sins. And thus our Lord preaches, an hour is coming now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those will hear will live. It is true, of course, that physical maladies, to be blind or to be deaf or mute or lame, for example, often have no connection with a person's individual sins. Do you remember this? The disciples asked. They said, did this man or his parents sin that he should be born blind? Our Lord answered, neither him nor his parents. But that the works of God may be manifest, may be displayed in Him. Thus we have no need to search for any reason why the ruler's daughter in our Gospel text died at such a young age, or why the woman who touched our Lord's robe suffered from a discharge of blood doing so for so long. Yet we can, nonetheless, see in instantiation, meaning a pointing to sin and its nature. Sin has brought defilement. Sin has brought death. The woman with the flow of blood was unclean and she was cut off from the temple. The woman who died was unclean and she's cut off from the land of the living. These two women are connected, not only by proximity, but also by a number. Number 12. It's St. Luke who tells us that the girl who died was 12 years old. And St. Matthew tells us that the woman who suffered with the discharge of blood did so for 12 years. Now the number 12 is usually connected with the 12 tribes. And there may be echoes here of Israel and Judah, sometimes depicted as women. Israel died. Judah was unclean. Regardless, in the physical maladies of these two women, we understand a much more deeper truth. God's people were spiritually unclean and spiritually dead. It is precisely women who are in view here, bearers of life, but yet are barren. One on account of a flow of blood, the other on account of being dead. And so if viewed from the angle of faith, it's difficult to discern here between the difference of faith and desperation. The ruler comes to Jesus only after his daughter has died. To whom else can he turn? 
Likewise, the woman with the flow of blood comes to Jesus, as St. Luke records, after she spent all that she had on other physicians. So perhaps desperation and faith are most clo or are more closely connected than our noble pretenses would like to admit. You see, if Jesus were not your only hope, would you be here this morning? And if he is your only hope, why would you ever fail to be here? You see. Not only does God's law serve as a mirror for us, revealing to us the true nature of our sins and our sinful condition, but even a mirror, like a real mirror, like a physical mirror, it serves as this same revealer of truth. I mean, why do you brush your teeth unless decay and rot lies within your very mouths? Why do you fret with lotions and makeup unless our skin itself speaks far too loudly of a fading vitality? Why do you despise graying hair and loss of it unless it portends to the fall and to the wintering of our bodies? My point is, not only is God's law a mirror revealing how we have not truly loved God with all of our hearts and our neighbors as ourselves, but even a mirror is a mirror of our fallen sinful condition. Even nature itself testifies of our sins and betrays our futile attempts to cover and to hide. Again, is it desperation or faith that leads us to the Lord for help? Or is there any significant difference? Would that ruler have come to Jesus if his daughter had not died? Would that woman have come to Jesus if her flow of blood had been healed long, 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 long ago? C.S. Lewis, he wrote this. He said, quote, We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, and he shouts in our pains. And then he had this line, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. No doubt pain is God's megaphone is a terrible instrument. It may lead to final and unrepentant rebellion, but it also gives the opportunity the bad man can have for amendment. It removes the veil plants the flag of truth within the fortress of our rebel souls. And might I add, pain is meant to lead us to our Lord Jesus. The decay and nature of our bodies is meant to lead us to the one in whom there is no decay. The dysfunction of our relationships is meant to lead us to the one in whom we may find true understanding and peace. So the test results or the, the, the diagnosis from the doctor's office, all the brushes with death, they're all meant to lead us to the one who is life. You've heard the adage, where there's smoke, there's fire. So too, where there's physical malady, there's spiritual malady. And thus we are driven to the one in whom there is forgiveness of sins, the one who rises before us as the Old Testament says, with healing in his wings. Will he heal a temporal, physical malady? If so, it is to show all the more how he will heal, heal the greater problem, the greater spiritual malady, and the root cause, and then raise us in our bodies, incorruptible, on the last day. But how does our Lord have the right to remove the just consequences of our sins? Precisely because He is the one who has come to bear the sins of the world in order to remove our griefs and our burdens here or hereafter. He must first bear our griefs and He must carry our burdens. And of course it's on the cross where Jesus does this most poignantly. His blood flowing for our forgiveness. 
his arms outstretched with healing in his wings. He who healed the woman with the flow of blood then bleeds himself. And from him comes a flow of blood that does not defile, but it cleanses. St. John writes, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. He who raised the ruler's daughter from death dies himself. Here is a death that puts death to death. As the author of Hebrews says, he has destroyed the power of death. At the heart of Matthew's account of the two women is the question of uncleanness. If Jesus, consider this, if Jesus were any other, to touch the unclean woman would have rendered himself unclean. If Jesus were any other to come in contact with the body of a deceased girl, would have rendered him unclean. In the first instance, the woman de deliberately reaches out and touches Jesus, running her hand over the fringe of his robe. In the second instance, it is Jesus who deliberately reaches out, touching the little girl and taking her hand. Not only does Jesus heal the one and resurrect the other, he renders each one clean. And that without defiling himself. This is the most intriguing, most welcoming, most comforting thing of all. Our Lord does not shy away from the unclean or defile himself or become defiled in his dealings with them. Our Lord will not shy away from us or become defiled by us. And thus your sins, your maladies of body, your maladies of soul will not cause him to withdraw from you or to recoil in horror. No. Here is one who cannot be defiled. One who is greater than all the sins. One who is greater than all maladies. One who is greater than the condemnation even of your own heart. One who is indeed greater than all hearts combined. Jesus allows himself to be grasped by the sinner, no matter how defiled. And he reaches out to grasp the sinner, no matter how defiled. Beloved, one kind of desperation or another has brought you to him. And this day, he allows himself to be grasped by you. By you. And he reaches out to grasp you as well. And this is the most holy and doing so in the most holy and unimaginable of ways. He gives to you His very body. He gives to you His very blood. What does the Scripture say in the Old Testament? Life is in the blood. And he gives it to you to purify you, to cleanse you, and as a promise that even as He forgives you all of your sins, He will cleanse and heal and He will raise your body so that even as He Himself has been risen from the grave, so too you shall rise. So no mirror of the law, no plain old everyday mirror will have the last word. That means no diagnosis, no pain, no alienation, and no loss. The last word belongs only to he who himself is last and the first. And he says, take heart. Your faith has saved you. Rise from your grave and enter the joy of your master. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand together.